So we finished a series today called uh, Hearing the Voice of God. The title is Use Your Inside Voice, but it's really a five-step guide to being able to hear God's voice clearly every time you pray. Uh, so hopefully you get something out of today's message. It's a blessing uh, to your life. So let me start with this. And teachers can't uh, be involved in this dialogue. So if you're a teacher, you might have knowledge. You can't participate. And this is a no Google. So if you see somebody Google, uh, start Googling the answer, um, I want you to call them out and point at them and, and say that's not fair, okay? Anybody think they have any idea what the noisiest animal on the planet is? The, the noisiest animal that makes the, the most noise. Kelly, you think you know? The donkey. Kelly Farrow thinks the donkey is the loudest animal on the planet. And what kind of sound do you think the donkey would make, Kelly? Now, really loudly so everybody can hear you with some passion. No, that's not passionate enough. And the people in the back can't hear you. I like that, Kelly. That's great. So Kelly, Kelly Farrow votes for the donkey. Yes, sir? The peacock. What do you think the peacock? What sound is the peacock? I like it. That's great. Awesome. So we got the donkey and we got the peacock. Anybody else want to take a run at uh, Yes, ma'am. The, the, the what now? The whole monkey? The howling monkey? And, Miss, and Mrs. Barnett, what, what would that monkey sound like? I want to hear what you think that monkey, what does that monkey sound like? <laughs> One more time, I didn't hear that. Could you do that? I like that. That's, that's, I don't know if that's true or not. That's my favorite. I like that. I like it. That's great. Donkey, peacock, and whatever that monkey is. I don't know what that is. So, what's the name of it again? The howling monkey. All right. All right. Very good. Uh, Kevin? The osprey, and what do you think the osprey, stand up and I want you to make not only the sound, but I want you to do the most, the hand motions. Come on, I'll do it with you. Are you ready? Do you want me to come back to you, you know, while you're thinking about it? Okay. All right. Anybody else? You know where this is going, so, so, so. anybody else want to make a guess? Yes, ma'am. The kookaburra. What does the kookaburra say? Paloma. Oh, you raised your hand, so you can't pass it off. What is the kookaburra? Oh, I like it. That's cool. All right. Kev, did you come up with something? All right. Of the five, who thinks the monkey, you're hoping it's the monkey, right? Right. So in the first service, we, get, we had a lion guess, and we, we had a, a, a hawk guess. We had some different things. How about if I told you, it's going to be strange, but the loudest animal on the planet is the sperm whale. The, the sperm whale clicks. The sperm whale clicks, and its clicking is measured at 225 decibels. For reference, let me tell you how loud that is. A jet engine measures 150 decibels, and a jackhammer about 140, and all kinds of, you know, cutting the grass and different things are right in the 125 decibels. But the sperm whale's clicking is 225, and here's what's interesting. When it releases that clicking sound, the sound can be heard up to 10,000 miles away. In other words... There are a lot of times that there are voices that are so powerful that they can impact the world. Did you know that there was an earthquake one time in Indonesia that the earthquake was so loud that it was actually heard almost on the other side of the, of the continent, of the, the planet in Australia. They heard the, the faint, by the time it got there, obviously it was, it was just a measurable, almost like a humming sound. But think about that. It traveled the entire uh, span of the globe to the other side was the, was the volume of the explosion. And that decibel level is not the same as the whale's clicking. I know I've never guessed that before. Did you know 
that the Bible says that God's voice is so powerful and so mighty that it simply transforms things when it's released. How about this about God's word and his voice? Did you know that Edwin Hubble in the 1920s began to research and study uh, the reflection of light? And, And here was the end of his discovery. Hubble, and I know you know that name if you've got a Hubble telescope or have ever heard of a Hubble telescope. What, what Hubble discovered was this, that our scope of what the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy was, and how many galaxies were beyond that uh, were actually missed. He began to see the fraying of light through his studies, and here's what he came to realize, that our galaxy is not the end of the, of the universe. Actually, there are 200, at his, at his study, 200 billion galaxies. 200 billion galaxies. And also what he discovered was this, that the galaxies were still expanding. Now I know you might have a lot of reasons why you think that's the case. Can I go back to what I think it is? It's four words that God spoke. Let there be light. If you don't think the voice of God can transform things, if you don't think the voice of God can supernaturally move things, then we fail to realize how powerful the voice of God is. God's voice, spoken thousands of years ago, is still releasing the expansion of our universe and the expansion of light. Let there be light, and we still have the expansion of galaxies. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I'm going to have you turn to several different places as we conclude this series. I want you to go, first of all, to Psalm chapter 29 and hold your place there while I give us a quick recap. If you've missed the first few weeks, we've been talking about, again, the the power of being able to hear God's voice every single time you pray. So here's where we started. Four weeks ago, we, we looked at Isaiah chapter 40, and here's what we discovered. We discovered that waiting on the Lord is not sitting and, and, and not doing something. Waiting on the Lord is actually tying together all the different strands of our relationship with God. It means to tie together like a cord ties something together. So in other words, as you tie together your, your study of God's Word, uh, your prayer life, your coming to church life, as you start intertwining those, actually what it does, whether you realize it or not, it tunes your hearing to a higher level. In other words, if we only do one, we'll have limited hearing. There are people that come to church consistently, but they don't read their Bible and they don't, they don't pray and, hey, my relationship with God is I come to church. And look, I, I'm not saying that's bad. Great you come to church, but you understand that if you've got only one portion of your relationship with God working, you'll have limited hearing. The more you intertwine those together, the more you hear the Lord. Week two, we looked at a story where, where Samuel was, was given by his mom to Eli to train as a prophet as a little boy. Remember the story of Hannah giving, giving um, Samuel to Eli. And the difference was, here's Eli, who only would listen to part of what God said. He, when it came to his kids and their disobedience, he was totally ignoring God. And what we discovered is this, if we want to hear God, we can't pick and choose. We got to be willing to listen to everything. Listen, we even got to listen to things where where God says, go make this right, go change this, go fix this, go do this the right way. Listen, if if we only pick and choose the things we want to hear, then we'll have limited hearing. We won't hear the Lord clearly if we just pick and choose. Two weeks ago, we looked at Elijah. Remember this on the top of Mount Carmel in in 1 Kings chapter 19. I love this one. Uh, Elijah's there. He has this incredible encounter then ends up running after all this display of the power of God being released, then he ends up running and thinking he's the only one that loves God anymore. And through that, God God basically brought him back to this. If we can get on the same page of why we need to have communication, you'll hear clearly. You see, for many of us, the only reason we want God to speak is we want God to tell us what to do. God, tell me how I can fix my financial problem. Tell me how I can fix this problem. Help me fix this problem. Help me fix this problem. And if all we ever want from God is a directional manual, we'll have limited hearing is what the Lord says. Our goal in in, in communication with God is just simply to be close, to have communion and relationship with Him. As we do that, the directions are clear. God says if we'll draw close to Him, then our directions of everything we need in our life. You know what I found? I found that God will even give me directions to things I didn't ask for. That that I needed, but I didn't even know I needed to ask. God will tell me what to do. 
But unfortunately, and look up here a second, don't miss this. Unfortunately for many of us, we live crisis to crisis. Let me say that again. Unfortunately for many of us, we live crisis to crisis. So it's hard to break the cycle of needing God to tell us what to do to fix the problem. We know God can do it. And so we live in such a cycle of we move from this problem to this problem to this health problem to this financial problem and we're just constantly, God help me, God help me, God help me. And we miss the, we miss the, the power of just being intimate, close with him. Because it's, if we can get that part, then God will speak really clearly and we'll get the benefit of knowing what to do. Last week, and if you didn't get a chance to hear this one, I hope you're getting the email uh, that we send out every week because the, the actual um, um, file to listen to this message was there and, and, and I got so such good response of people saying it freed me up L- listen the most important thing you can hear in this series I think so far is that the spot that you talk to God needs to be uniquely you L- listen this was so freeing to me I mean and this is not a when I, when I say these kind of things I, I mean I kid with my mom and dad a lot but this is not a my mom and dad thing you know in the culture I grew up in you know church wise you know, you get exposed to things like this. You can only pray if you're on your knees. You got to find a you got to find a, a closet to, to kneel in. Here's my problem with closets and kneeling. Number one, I don't like closed in spaces. Come on, somebody. I mean, my, my thought is a closet's for your clothes, and most of the time, my dirty clothes are on the floor of the closet. Can anybody? I'm the only one. Okay, all right. So, so secondly, when I'm kneeling. The only, I'm just be honest with you. The only thing I'm thinking when I'm kneeling is when's this over? Because it hurts my knees. I want to get up. And so I found I was not at all focused on hearing God. All I was thinking is when can I be done? The freeing thing for me in this series has been this. The spot that God wants to meet with you is as unique as you are. Look, Moses met with God in a bush. Elijah met with God on the top of a mountain. Jacob met with God by a rock. Jonah met with God in the belly of a whale. Come on, somebody. Uh, Daniel met with God looking out of a window. Look, however you are created, as unique as you are, that ought to be the spot you meet with God. Because guess what? God can speak to you. It's not the spot. It's be quiet that God's looking for. If you got your Bible, so let's look at um, Psalm chapter 29. Let's open up with a few verses this morning. Verse number 1 through 4. It says, Give unto the Lord... O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory, do his name. Worship him in the beauty of holiness. David shifts and starts talking about the power of God's voice. He says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. I love verse 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. Circle that word if you're taking notes in your Bible. Because it actually means this. It means that God's voice is custom fitted to you. Where, the, where it says the Lord is powerful. Did you realize that the way that you hear God and the way I hear God is going to be different. Because God customizes his voice to your creation. So guess what? God might speak to you. In a way, he's not going to speak to me because we're not the same. Now, here's what that brings into focus. Did you realize that all of us have discovered through the last couple decades of science that how unique we are because of our DNA? That basically, whatever DNA you have, that's the only, you're the only match to that DNA on the planet, basically. That the chances of you sharing DNA with somebody else is in the billions of, of possibilities. Basically, here's what that means is God speaks billions of different languages. Isn't that great? The voice of the Lord is powerful. It is specifically designed to meet the creation. So let me give you seven ways real quick, just a couple of thoughts on on how God actually speaks if he customizes his voice. Listen, first of all, God does speak through his word. How How many would agree with that? No, I didn't feel any excitement over that. God does speak through his word. I'm going to share a story with you I think is extremely cool. And uh, actually, Jimmy Davis uh, called and gave me this story, so I'll give him credit for it. But I thought it was really, really cool. In the 1800s, there was a man uh, named Matthew Maury, is his last name? Is that the right pronunciation? Uh, Matthew Maury ended up going into the Navy. And while he was in the Navy, he had an accident that left him 
um, somewhat uh, disabled, um, being able to walk and move. And so they, they assigned him to an area where he began to do ocean study of the floor of the ocean. And he kept feeling like that there was um, a way, surely, as much as, I mean, he loved science, but surely there was a way that uh, ships could travel faster across the ocean. Because in the 1800s, if you wanted to get on an ocean and you had a, you know, a, a meeting across the ocean or you had somewhere you wanted to go, you were literally weeks on a boat getting across the ocean. And so Maury thought, well, th there's got to be a better way than just tying up six weeks of your life if you want to go and come back. Just can you imagine that? Six weeks, no phone call, no text message, no, no Facebook. You, just, you can't call, you can't write, you just got to get on a boat and go if you want to go and take six weeks of your life just in travel. So Maury, while he loved science, he also loved God's Word. So he, he was reading through the Psalms, and he got to Psalm chapter 8, and here's what he discovered. Psalm chapter 8 says that God actually reveals the paths in the sea. When Maury read that word, you know what he discovered? What he realized? He realized that, that there must be a path in the sea that would make it an easy passage, that that was what was God's Word was saying. So based on that revelation, he started studying the currents, and here's what he figured out. There's a current in the Atlantic Ocean that if you get in that current, it will take off three weeks of travel time. Wow. He discovered this by putting things in bottles that, that went underneath the sea, and they would track the current, and so he found the right place where the current... Did you know still today that you can make the time every ship that travels is looking for that lane. Because if they can catch that lane, they can cut their travel time almost down to nothing. And what's amazing is this. It works both ways, coming and going. God does speak by His Word. Did you realize if a man can find a current in the ocean from the Word of God, everything that you have need of is in the Word of God. No, 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 let me say that again. Everything practically you need on the earth, God's got in His Word. What you need for a job, what you need relationally, what you need financially, God's got a plan. The problem is we don't look hard enough, we don't give God the opportunity to speak through His Word enough. Number two, God speaks through desires. Did you know that some of the things you want to do that you're concerned about, that God actually put those desires in your heart? You know what's really cool? The problem is, and I used to think this. I used to think, well, the, the, the Lord, you know, I got things that I really want to do, but I don't know that, I mean, that they equal going to church. I, I don't mean going to church, but, you know, the, the desires in my heart are the things I really am passionate about wanting to do. I'm trying to figure out how that works with church is what I'm trying to Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Some of you walk away passionate, I don't have to come to church. That's not what I said. <laughs> but I kept trying to figure out how, how I you know, the passions and desires that I had in my heart, how that worked with, with church life. And here's what I realized, that, that uh, Matthew chapter 6 says, if I'll seek first the kingdom, that God will give me the desires of my heart. In other words, did you realize, if, if God is first in our seeking pattern, what will happen is God will heighten our desires and show us how to use those desires for the glory of God. No, no, you don't understand what I just said to you. If you're passionate about cooking, God's not trying to get you to stop cooking and go on the mission field. If you're passionate about cooking, here's what I'm saying to you. God put that desire in your heart. The reason I know that is I have no passion for cooking. I do have a passion for eating, though. So, so I just want to be attached to somebody that's got a passion for cooking. Can anybody say, yeah, I'm, I'm in the right crowd. My old bulldog, Ke Kelly's been out of town for a couple days, so I feel so out of sorts trying to figure out life. She, she went, um, a friend of hers had a birthday, so she went to celebrate that. And so she's been gone. And, and the bulldogs, uh, our English bulldog, for those of you who don't know this, you're new to our church, we've got a bulldog. It is clearly my wife's dog, not mine. <laughs> it's very true. Uh, when she left, I noticed that he was sitting over in the corner and crying. He was depressed that she was gone. I kept saying, I'm here crying about I'm here and he let me know that I am a I am a I'm a, a lame replacement for her just so you know <laughs> but then that dog loves to eat I'm telling you what he he loves it you put stuff in his bowl I, I've never heard somebody that enjoys eating more than that bulldog <laughs> it's amazing look maybe you're a cook 
Did you realize as you seek God first, what ends up happening is God's not going to take your desire to cook and remove it. What he's going to do is heighten it and show you how to use it for the glory of God. How about this? Tim Lewis loves to grill. How about this? As he has sought the Lord, isn't it amazing that God's given him the ability to stand outside and use his gift for the kingdom this morning? Isn't that great? And guess what? We're all going to get to partake today. Number three, God speaks through open doors. God speaks through doors. It's so important if you've not heard the teaching on the Revelation doors, 3, 8, 3, 24, 1. God does want to open doors that you step through that you can hear his voice. Number four, God speaks through dreams. Look, look get, it, get in a habit of writing down dreams because God is speaking through dreams. You say, well, how, how do I know? Uh, how will I know what it is? Well, well Jesus taught in parables, stories, so that the disciples would understand the power of the kingdom of God. Listen, I'm telling you, write down elements of your dreams and then begin to ask the Lord what those mean because God is speaking through dreams. Job said this, he said, while I sleep, you plant seeds of destiny in my heart. Did you know some of us, the only time that God can speak where we're quiet enough to hear him is when we're sleeping? Isn't this true? For some of us, we're so busy with activity that we can't be quiet enough for God to speak. Sometimes that's the only time that God's got is when you're asleep. Number six, God speaks through other people. Number, number, number five, God speaks through people. Number six, God, God will speak through a prompting. Call this person. Follow up on this. Do this. Reach out to this person. Don't miss that. How about this? You're standing in line out there. All of a sudden, God says, buy, buy this person's a ticket for lunch. Listen to those promptings because you have no idea what it is that God might reveal to you. Listen to his promptings. Did you know that David Wilkerson, who's gone on to be with the Lord, but David Wilkerson, who started the Teen Challenge Ministry that now is all over the world, helping those that are hurt, and got addictions and habits and hang-ups being freed. Did you know that the government of Ireland that does not even, listen to this, the government of Ireland that does not even believe in God. Listen, the government of Ireland that does not believe in God, the president of Ireland, not Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, he does not, they don't believe in, in God the way we do. As a matter of fact, they won't let the church own property, and they won't let the church meet freely. They, they, they think it's a cult for you to follow Jesus at all. Kelsey and I actually preached in a church over there and led worship one time in a house church where I gave an altar call and two people got saved. I was disappointed because I'm thinking, you know, we give altar calls and people get saved every week. The pastor came up to me sobbing. He goes, did people really raise their hands? I'm like, yeah, why? He goes, we've been meeting as a church, and that's the truth. We've been meeting as a church for five years. That's the first salvations we've ever had. I'm like, you're kidding he goes, you don't understand. For people to raise their hands and follow God, it cost them everything here. Their families turn their back on them. They seize their land. They lose their jobs. They do not consider it lightly for them to raise their hands and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. You see, that Teen Challenge Center, that that president doesn't even believe in God, but because they're delivering people from their problems, the president of Ireland is supporting Teen Challenge the president of Ireland is supporting him, not because he believes in God, but because it looks good on his political resume. They're emptying the jails of heroin addicts being delivered in the Teen Challenge Centers. You see, that center got started because David Wilkerson heard a gang member sharing something, and he believed that God's power could deliver that gang member. So he left Pennsylvania and went to New York City to help gang members be free of heroin. Started Teen Challenge, started Times Square Church, his, his ministry has reached around the world all because he listened to a prompting. Number seven, last but not least, pain. Now, look, I know none of us want to vote for this one. But God's voice does speak through our pain. It doesn't cause it, but he does speak through it. Now, let me finish this now that I've told you how powerful the voice of God is. Let me remind you of one other thing. Did you realize that from birth, from before birth, from creation, in your mother's womb, that you are imprinted to follow God's voice, to hear it and follow it? You're imprinted. Let me show you a couple of verses. Psalm 139, uh, verse 13 through 18. You can read the rest for yourself. You formed me in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, David says. 
marvelous of your works that my soul knows this very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place and skillfully fraught, uh, wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. They were fashioned before me before one of them came to be. In other words, did you realize there is an imprinted um, DNA on your life to hear God's voice and follow you? There's a man named Lorenz uh, in 1973 that did a study on imprintedness, you know, on, on geese. You know what he discovered? That within one day of a, of a of gosling being born, uh, they can't see, but there is an imprinted thing on their minds to hear their mother's voice and follow it so that they know where to go. Did you know it's why predators try to kill the eggs and get the, the geese as soon as they're born? Because if they can disrupt the imprinted process, the geese will wander and not have any direction. Did you realize that that's why the enemy is after children? Did you know that the very first part of your sensory being to be developed when you're in your mother's womb is your inner ear? That a child develops that at four months of, of pregnancy. The, the, the fetus, the child in the mother's womb develops, that inner ear is developed first. Isn't this interesting that you're trying to help people sometimes that don't have any balance in their life, that they can't get their relationships and their work and everything balanced? Isn't it interesting that the reason that people lose their balance is because of an inner ear problem? Hearing God is, is powerful to balance it's powerful to be imprinted to follow the voice of God. God has imprinted you to hear his voice. And understand this, the enemy's trying to disrupt that so you can't hear his voice. Finally, last but not least, and I'll finish this series. The reason that we have a struggle is because we are abnormally imprinted in our following of God. There's an abnormality in the imprintedness. Let me show you one more passage of scripture. Psalm, uh, Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 2 through 7. Paul says to the, the Philippian church, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And then these next two verses, here's so you understand what he's saying to this group of followers. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Almost done. Everybody look up here. It's so important. Here's what Paul is saying his revelation is. That how God started the relationship with you is how he's going to finish it. This is, this is critical. God, this is, please hear me. God never differentiates beginning, and end. So, well, I know some of you are like, I got up and drove all the way over here to church. Why don't you tell me something I don't know, preacher? I, I understand. But let me tell you the problem. You see, none of us have any struggle with believing that how our relationship with God began was because God loved us. For God so loved you, he gave his only begotten son that if you would believe you would have eternal life. In other words, the reason we have a relationship with God is not because of something we do, but only because of something that He does. Look, God doesn't love me because I did good or because I did something worthy of being loved. God loves me because of who He is. Amen. And that's the only reason. This is what I'm saying to you. We all accept and believe at the beginning that God loves us. But for many of us, as we track through life and through our relationship, we think that that doesn't stay consistent. That somehow God starts with love and then he turns into a taskmaster. We think he starts loving us and then he turns into, you can't keep the rules. I'm not happy with you. I'm going to throw you out. What Paul is saying to the Philippian church is this. How God started is how he's going to finish. He started off loving you, and it never stops, and that's how he's going to finish the game. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Some of the religious, I'm, I'm going to be able to figure out who the religious people are because I'm about to make them mad. Look, look at your neighbor and say, I hope that's not you. Are, you. are you ready for this? In other words, 
All of your problems are not your fault. I know some of you are like, I could have gone all year coming to church. Because you, t- you know what we all want? We want somebody to stand up and say, be responsible for your problems, right? The, the issue really gets down to this. The issue is not my problem. The issue is I have a misunderstanding of who God is that he's not changed. Amen. The reason I have, and you see, here's why I'm saying this. Is when you and I have a struggle, here's how we fix it. We either run, we fight. We blame somebody else. We get under guilt and condemnation. We let fear get a hold of us. And then we the last place we come is to God to get it fixed. Here's what I'm saying to you. When you struggle with guilt, when you struggle with condemnation, when you struggle with pride, it's not a you thing. It's not about you. It's about your misunderstanding that God's not changed. This is what Paul's saying. Look, he's saying... Get some confidence. Know this, that how God started with you is how God's going to finish with you. Now, I know you're thinking that's not what the verse says. Let me show you one more verse to prove it. Look at verse 7. He says, just as it is right for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, listen to this, here's why. You get it right. Because you are partakers with me of grace. The only way that you and I will ever get it is that we become partakers of grace. In other words, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying if if anger is the problem, don't go get anger counseling first. You know what the prayer needs to be? God, help me have a better understanding of your mercy. You see, what, you see, look, I'm, I'm not saying don't get some counsel and get some help. I'm saying the starting place has to be that we understand who God is. He's the same from beginning to end. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's the same tomorrow. God has not changed, he's the same. Our problem is this, we start thinking he's this way, and as we progress in life, we think he changes. The reality is, This is called abnormal imprinting. Are you following me this morning? It's the enemy starts bombarding us with guilt, bombarding us with condemnation, bombarding us with religion, bombarding us with fear. And so what we do is we started out listening to God say, I love you. And then all of a sudden, as we start moving through life, all we hear is you're not good enough. You're not going to make it. You can't do it. And then we start believing it. And all of a sudden, we've shut down the ability to hear the voice of God. It comes back to this truth. God's the same. So if I'm having a struggle, then I don't understand his power. And I need to ask him to help me understand it. How about this? If pride's the issue, it's a misunderstanding of God's greatness, not mine. If I'm struggling with trust, it's a misunderstanding of God's goodness. A precious lady came up to me at the end of the first service. She goes, Pastor, I was just visiting this morning. I live live out of state. She goes, I'm struggling with trust issues. What do I do? I said, ask God to show you his goodness. I said, look up in the concordance every, in your Bible. Every place that the, the, the Lord's goodness is revealed. And it will deal with your trust issues. You can see, God's not changed. He's the same when you began. He's going to be the same at the end. Amen. Amen. How about this? If there's a, a problem with control, it's a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty. Are you getting this this morning? This is powerful, folks. If if there's a struggle with guilt in your life, that you just constantly keep going back to your past of what you did wrong, let me me tell you what it is. It's a misunderstanding of God's grace. I'm freeing you up this morning. Stop blaming you. It's not about you. If you can hear the voice of God, it will transform your life. Can I tell you one more story and pray for you? This is my favorite story. In the 1930s, if you went to elementary school in the United States of America, there was one day of a year that there was a hearing test. And here's what the hearing test was. You went up to the teacher's desk, and you stood at the desk. You covered one ear, and she leaned over and whispered a phrase in your ear. And for you to pass the hearing test, you had to repeat verbatim back to her what she said. Now, that's no longer in schools today. But in the 30s and 40s, that's the way they tested your hearing. There was a little girl, true story, named Mary Ann Bird. Mary Ann Bird in the late 1930s had had a problem um, with a cleft being damaged. 
the damage to the cleft had caused her to not be able to speak, not be able to function verbally, and it caused deafness in one ear, almost complete deafness in the other ear. Mary Ann Bird, every year when they did this test, she failed the hearing test, and it would prompt all the shame and uh, difficulty and, and, and things that go with failing a test. You know, her classmates would make fun of her. Uh, she was at the place of just almost wanting to give up, and, you know, uh, she, she wrote this in a, in a, in a book of, an event that transformed her life. She got a teacher in the fourth grade called Mrs. Leonard. Uh, Mrs. Leonard spent the entire school year confirming over and over again to every student how much she loved them, how special they were, and they just felt, uh, in her own book, uh, Marion Bird goes back to this one year to say it was transformational in my life. And they kind of did an interview for, with her in the middle of the book and she said, they said, is there one particular thing that was transformational that Mrs. Leonard did? She said, yes, it was the hearing test day. They said, well, please tell us the story. She said, I went up to the desk and she said, I had been listening all year long, watching her mouth, watching her actions of her telling me that she loved me. So when I went up and every student in our class that she was so accepting and so loving of every single student, every single student made leaps and bounds of progress because of the love that Mrs. Uh, Leonard showed them. Mary Ann Bird said, I walked up and I turned and I turned my ear towards her and I had to cover my other ear. She goes, so I cupped it hoping that I could get every little bit of sound that I could hear. She said, and I didn't hear a single thing that Mrs. Leonard said, but I was able to guess the phrase. And here was the phrase that Mrs. Leonard leaned over and whispered in her ear. I wish you were my little girl. Marianne Bird accounts in this book it was the single most transformational thing in her life. Did you know that Harvard University in the 1930s has started a study that's ongoing today that every two years they check back in with the living, surviving members of this study. They have spent almost 100 years, billions of dollars on this study. Did you know John F. Kennedy, before he was a senator and a president, was actually in the sophomore class at Harvard that was in this study. The files are actually stored in an office building behind Fenway Park in Boston. The professors came away after spending billions of dollars in 80 years of study. Here's what they came away with. Kids that were loved by their families had a greater rate of success of happiness. Billions of dollars in 80 years to tell you. Kids that feel loved make more money and are happier. What if, what if you and I were simply able to deal with this faulty imprinting that the enemy does on our lives and hear consistently God say, I'm glad you're my daughter, and I'm glad you're my son. Because you see, that's what the Lord's saying. The problem is not what the Lord's saying. The problem is what we're hearing. I hope you've gotten something out of this. Too. Amen. I lied. I got one more story. Have you ever wondered why Joshua got picked to succeed Moses as the leader of Israel? I always wondered, why not Caleb? Why not some of the other people? Why, why did Joshua get picked? I found a verse in studying for this series. I actually just ran across it by accident. In Exodus 33, 11, it says this. It says, Joshua never left the tent of meeting. Some of you might feel like that you're just struggling with life. You know what? Every single one of us have the same option to do. We can spend time in the presence of God. If we just figure out that God's for us, not against us, that God, that God wants to speak over your life the things about you that are accepted, that are celebrated, that are joyful, and that if I am struggling with something, it is not a me thing. It is a misunderstanding of who God is thing. 
I want to encourage you today. We can hear the voice of God. It's a good thing. Everybody said amen. Can you stand?